there. So the American people get it, the people of Tennessee get it, and we as elected representatives get it. We got that in the election of November 2nd. I would encourage my colleagues to vote to repeal Obamacare, and I urge my colleagues to do this, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman of California. I yield myself 30 seconds. I just stated to the gentleman from Tennessee, it's universally recognized that there was no worse designed health care plan than TenCare, that all you did was extend the benefits and no cost containment and no pay-fors, and it damn near bankrupted the state. And, and it's also recognized that nowhere has health care costs gone up faster than in the private sector, much faster than Medicare. Because once again, uh, there's not much in the way of cost containment. You just reimburse people for the cost. This legislation has cost containment, and that's why CBO says if you repeal it, you're going to drive up the short-term deficit to a $30 billion, long-term deficit, a trillion two hundred billion dollars. That's the difference. I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, New York, Ms. McCarthy, a member of the committee. The gentlelady from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, and I appreciate the time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in opposition of H.R. 2, a bill that would repeal the Patient Protection and Affordable uh, Care Act. The Affordable Care Act, signed into law in March, 10th, uh, March of 2010, is an important first step in reforming our health insurance system, a system that everyone knows is broken. The Affordable Care Act provides access to the insurance market for millions of Americans, pl puts in place important consumer protections, and reduces our country's deficit. This new Congress was elected promising a transparent process with input from all members. This repeal bill, however, has not even been considered by a single committee in the House. Members are also being shut out of the process. I co-sponsored four amendments submitted to the Rules Committee. None were accepted. I co-sponsored an amendment to ensure that women continue to receive the protections provided for the Affordable Care Act. The Republicans did not allow this amendment to come up to the floor. I co-sponsored an amendment to ensure that all seniors will continue to receive the increased benefits in Medicare and that the donut hole will continue to be closed. The Republicans did not allow this amendment to come up for a vote. I co-sponsored an amendment to ensure that small businesses continue to receive the tax cuts provided for the Affordable Care Act. The Republicans did not allow this amendment to come up for a vote. I co-sponsored an amendment to ensure that all responsible stewards of our federal budget and to prevent this repeal bill from adding to the deficit. The Republicans did not allow the amendment to come up for a vote. This new Congress ran on a campaign of lower taxes on small businesses and reducing the federal budget deficit. This bill, however, would rise taxes on small businesses and individuals and add a trillion dollars to the deficit. Just to be clear, a vote for this bill will be a vote for higher taxes and increase the deficit. Although there is an effort to bring this repeal bill to the floor today, what is being proposed in place of affordable care? Nothing. I, my expired. office has dealt with this for years. Please vote no on this bill. General, time time's expired. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I yield to the gentleman from Michigan, I'd like to yield 30 seconds to uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, uh, Dr. Rowe, to respond to the gentleman from California. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for 30 seconds. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, just, to, uh, just to my colleague from California, I would argue that Tennessee has thought this plan well out. And the problem with this plan is, is that when you have more services chasing fewer dollars, you're going to create weights and you're going to create uh, in a situation where we've shifted the cost. You talked about the, uh, private health insurance costs going up. That is true. Innovation, a lot of, a lot of reasons for that, uh, uh, Congressman. But one of the main reasons is an overpromise by government programs that shifts costs. We saw that in our state and we can do better. And so when you say that, we've looked. I, I yield back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you. And I, uh, I thank the gentleman. And now I'm pleased to yield uh, one minute to a member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I, I rise today in support of the repeal of the government's takeover of health care. We're well aware of how the health care law created hundreds of billions of dollars in new taxes while doing little to drive down costs and causing millions to lose access to health coverage. Even more troubling is how dramatically this law grows government and constricts individual freedom and American exceptionalism. When this law was passed, the Democrats said it would create 4 million new jobs. Instead, we got over 2,000 pages of job-killing new taxes and less choice. This law was clearly an overreach of government control. In place of government-run health care, 
true reform can be achieved through multiple patient-centered alternatives, including expanding HSAs, association health plans, and allowing the purchase of health insurance across state lines. Americans agree. A Gallup USA Today poll this week confirms that only 13 percent of Americans support the current law. Simply put, the American people want this law repealed, and so do I, as I promised, and I yield back. Gentleman uh, yields back. Gentleman from California. I yield uh, uh, two minutes to the gentlewoman from California, uh, Ms. Davis. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my mother always told me that if you have your health, you have everything, which is why I've always believed every American should have access to the care they need to be healthy. Now, my colleagues want to repeal health care without an alternative. Well, it's easy to say you're against something, but it's much harder to come up with solutions. Americans deserve to know how my colleagues' plan will protect patients. Specifically, women shouldn't get denied care based on gender or have to pay hundreds more insurance premiums than men, nor should they need a permission slip to see an OBGYN. The 32 million Americans without insurance need access to coverage. Insurers shouldn't deny children coverage because they've been sick. Medicare should be kept solvent over the long term, and seniors should have access to affordable prescriptions. Americans shouldn't face outrageous annual premium hikes, such as the 59% increase many of my own constituents are looking at today. The health care reform bill addresses each of these problems and many more. It's irresponsible to repeal without a plan to fix the issues in our health care system. And further, thanks to Governor Schwarzenegger's efforts before leaving office, California is leading the way in implementing reforms, already authorizing health insurance exchange marketplaces to buy affordable insurance. Repeal will cripple health reform efforts in my state and leave it without direction going forward. I can't support legislation that does not offer solutions and goes backward. So let's focus on creating jobs and not taking away health care from patients. General Lady yields back. General from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now I'm pleased to yield one minute to a new member of the committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hanna. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of H.R. 2 so that we may replace the well-intentioned but ill-conceived health care law signed last year with reforms that increase access to care and lower cost. We know that the current law raises premiums. We know that it cuts Medicare by more than $500 billion. That's unacceptable to the over 120,000 seniors in my district who rely on Medicare benefits. We know it raises taxes, imposes costs on small businesses, and will substantially burden New York. Tomorrow, I will vote to instruct committees, including the Education and Workforce Committee, to produce a thoughtful and improved legislation. I look forward to supporting reforms that lower premiums through competition, allow folks with the pre-existing conditions access to affordable health care, reform the medical liability system, pre preserve a patient's ability to keep their own plan, and expand incentives to encourage personal responsibility for health care coverage and cost. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. Where am I here? Hold on here, sir. Uh, I yield two minutes to uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt, a member of the committee. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to the budget-busting legislation that fails to create one new job and returns our health decisions to insurance companies rather than doctors. Repealing the health reform law would be a big mistake. Instead of focusing on job creation and, or retirement security or fair taxes, uh, we're debating repealing a law that protects Americans from insurance company abuses, provides fairer and more accessible health reform for children, for veterans, for seniors, for employees, for employers. The law saves the average taxpayer money, and it saves the insured money. Uh, on Monday, we celebrated uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. 
Uh, Dr. King fought for an America where everyone, regardless of race or class background, had access to the American opportunity. He said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Today, the new majority is trying to repeal the health reform law that we enacted just one year ago. That historic law provides secure health insurance coverage to almost all Americans and lowers the deficit. The days of you're on your own are past now. The law ensures that health insurance companies actually have to provide health insurance, uh, not just in name, but it requires that they spend your premium dollars on actually providing health care. If this reform law were repealed, Anna's 24-year-old son in Kendall Park, New Jersey would become uninsured. Todd from Eatontown would not be able to get insurance due to his pre-existing condition. Thousands of seniors on Medicare, like Howard from Monroe, would not be able to afford his life-saving prescriptions. Matthew from West Windsor wrote me to say, I just graduated from college. I'm working on a job with no health care. He's grateful now that he can be on his parents' health insurance plan, but he's concerned if this is repealed, he says, I have a pre-existing condition, and shockingly, I truly would be without insurance and Time's in big expired. trouble if this law were reversed. Time's I Time's urge expired. my colleagues to vote no on repealing the health care reform law. Gentlemen from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased now to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Rakita. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. One minute. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Uh, I thank the gentleman from Minnesota for yielding me time. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of freedom for every American and against the expansion of government. The people of Indiana sent me to Washington, D.C. with very specific instructions. Get the government out of our lives. Therefore, I will be voting yes on H.R. 2. Every honest person in this debate knows that this law doesn't solve the problems in our health care system. Its solution to destroy the best health care system in the world and replace it with even more inefficiencies, government controls, loss of personal freedom and trillions in new costs to the taxpayers will fail. And let's not forget that there are programs already in place that are supposed to do many of the things the President has talked about his law doing. We should start with reforming those. Also, health savings accounts, insurance across state lines, covering pre-existing conditions and even subsidizing the poor's purchase of a private policy should all be implemented. Health care is not a right. And if we are not careful, the feel-good, empty promises made in this law will bankrupt our country and leave our grandkids to pay for it. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva, a member of the committee. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, I rise today in opposition to a regressive and unfair, unfair piece of legislation, H.R. 2. We must protect the American people from the Republican no-care agenda. Their agenda for America is simple. No care if you lose your job. No care if you or your child has a pre-existing condition. No care if you are a senior in a donut hole. No care if you're under 26 and on your parents' plan. No care if you get sick and your insurer drops your coverage. No care if your insurer hikes your premiums higher than you can afford. No care for Indian Health Care Services reauthorization. No care for community health centers. No care for closing the disparity gap in America's health care delivery system. I urge my colleagues to vote against this repeal to take away the, that would take away the progress that we are making to protect our constituents. I urge my colleagues to stop, stop protecting insurance companies and finally finally take a step toward empowering the American people. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now I'm very pleased to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, a physician, the gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon. Uh, gentleman thank you, from Chairman Indiana Klein. Is uh, for Mr. One minute. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 2, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. I consider this one of the most crucial votes in this Congress. As a cardiothoracic surgeon, I can speak on the perspective of a physician who has dealt with the growing need for health care reform in our country. We all know there are too many uninsured, too many underinsured. 
but a government solution is the wrong approach. This law does nothing to address the critical issue in health care today, and that's the rising cost of health care. Now let's touch with my patients. Sixty to seventy percent of my patients are in Medicare. A five hundred billion dollar cut in the funding of Medicare and decreasing reimbursement for physicians, for hospitals and other providers over the course of time will lead to what it's led to in every other country that has a government health care system, system, rationing of health care for some of the most vulnerable people in our society, our American seniors. Uh, gentleman from California. Thank you. Are you uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, a member of the committee. Mr. Scott, a uh, gentleman from California, uh, Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's important that we focus attention on the substance of the debate on health care. Some think just calling health care reform, repealing health care reform, uh, Obamacare, or calling it um, a job killer when it will actually create jobs, or even uh, calling it uh, government takeover when it doesn't even include a public option, uh, constitutes uh, discussion. But we need to talk about what's actually in the bill and what's uh, actually going to be repealed. Because we need, we need to talk about what's going to happen to those under 26 that are now able to stay on their po parents' policies. Repeal will kick them off of those policies. We need to talk about what's going to happen to those with pre-existing conditions. We need to talk about what's happening to those who can now get checkups and annual, uh, annual checkups and preventive care with no co-pays and deductibles. We need to talk about the fact that we're digging senior citizens out of the donut hole, and repeal will keep them in the donut hole. Insurance reform, uh, no rescissions, no cutting off somebody in the middle, cutting off insurance in the middle of a treatment. We need to talk about what we're doing for, uh, re to, for uh, unreasonable increases. That's what you're going to be repealing if you uh, repeal health care reform. Affordability. All Americans under health care reform in 2014 will be able to afford health care. Uh, we'll be giving tax credits to businesses to encourage them to uh, provide health care. This bill will create jobs. You'll be destroying jobs. And you say nothing about the deficit. The CBO has already calculated that you will significantly increase the deficit if this bill passes. Mr. Speaker, health care reform is a matter of life and death. If Republicans want to repeal health care, they ought to be clear and tell the public what will actually happen to young adults, those with pre-existing conditions, seniors, what's going to happen to the donut hole or insurance abuses, or the future of affordability of health care. We should not just be resorting to labels and slogans. We have to be clear of what we're doing to the public. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now I'm pleased to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for one Thank minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Constitution of the United States has limits, and surely one of those limits must be that Congress cannot compel a private citizen to engage in a private commercial transaction. Surely the Congress of the United States cannot compel a person to purchase life insurance because generational debt is a bad thing. Surely the Congress of the United States cannot compel someone to purchase vision insurance or dental insurance. The Constitution of the United States places limits on Congress, and it is time that this body honored those limits envisioned by our forefathers. And to ask for self-restraint or respect for the Constitution should not invite challenges to our humanity or accusations of moral acquiescence. Um, I'm from the upstate of South Carolina, and every time I go home, I hear about the need for health reform and the fear that people have with respect to pre-existing conditions. But I support a solution that is patient-centered and not government-centric. I support a solution that is affordable and not generational embezzlement, and I support a solution uh, of that is consistent with the Constitution. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, a member of the committee. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for two minutes. I ask minutes. consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, it is deeply disappointing that following last week's near universal calls for unity and cooperation, amidst all the calls to lower the temperature of political discourse and to move to working together towards solving America's pressing issues, the new Republican majority is moving full steam ahead with an attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act. The health care law may not be perfect, that prospect would always certainly be open to debate. And its suggestions on how it might be improved might also be open to debate. 
But instead of working together and building on the work that's been done and the progress that's been made, we find ourselves here today debating and voting on a bill which, while it may pass the House, most certainly will never become law, and nor should it. Some may call it political catharsis. Others may call it pure theater, plain and simple. But let's be clear. The positive impact that the existing health care reform law is having on millions of residents and families in all of our districts is very real. And the law's important common sense consumer protections are very popular. Specifically, this misguided legislation would spell the end of one meaningful consumer protection, which I and others fought to get into the law. This protection, the medical loss ratio requirement, holds insurance companies accountable and ensures consumers are receiving the health services for which they are paying top dollar. In 1993, many private companies routinely spent 95 cents of every dollar on health services. By 2008, in the absence of regulation otherwise, many had reduced their spending on health services to below 75% some even to less than 60% of those premium dollars. That meant that companies could spend up to 43 cents of your premium dollar on executive salaries, advertising, lobbyists, bonuses, dividends, and other administrative costs, instead of using it for what you had contracted for, health care. To keep their excessive profits up, you may have been charged ever higher premiums or may have been denied care through a number of anti-consumer gimmicks. You might have been denied coverage because you or your family member had a pre-existing condition or you had coverage capped annually or in a lifetime, stopping coverage when it was most needed. Or as a parent, you would refuse coverage for your children under 26, even if they were still unemployed and were, work and were working someplace where coverage Gentleman wasn't available. Expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. All of these injustices are addressed in the bill, Gentleman. and repeal would reverse that. Gentleman's I ask time's that this misguided bill fail and ask my colleagues to vote against it. Gentleman's time's expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. May I inquire of the Speaker how much time is remaining on each side? Gentleman from Minnesota has 26 and a half minutes. Gentleman from California has 22 minutes. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm very pleased to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, the gentle lady from Alabama, Mrs. Roby. Gentle lady from Alabama is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to stand with my colleagues in support of HR2 that will repeal the Health Care Reform Act. Sadly, this law is about providing health care for all citizens, and more, it's le law is less about providing health care for all citizens and more about expanding federal government. It translates into substantial cost, over $500 billion that must be paid by hardworking, taxpaying Americans. In economic hard times, it is our responsibility to ensure that this does not occur. If we do not repeal this law, our inaction will serve as nothing less than gross fiscal irresponsibility. This must not happen. I want to tell you about the owner of the Pizza Hut in Headland, Alabama, who will be forced to close his doors due to the cost associated with this law. And then there's the gentleman that owns pharmacies throughout the Southeast, who told me he has the ability to create two jobs, but cannot do so because he doesn't know what the federal government's going to do to him next. Just like our forefathers answered the call to right wrongs, we too must answer the call. The citizens in our district have spoken, and in their words, we must repeal this law. Gentleman's time is expired. Gentleman from California. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe it is time that this Congress does what President Obama called on Americans to do last week, approach our debates and our differences with civility and honesty. We appear to be doing reasonably well with regard to civility, but less so with honesty. Once again, we tackle health care, and the debate is sliding back to one-line attacks and misrepresentation instead of the new health care law's merits or its actual impact on real Americans. The Affordable Care Act has been referred to as a job-crushing law. This is simply not honest, as my colleagues across the aisle disregard the fact that since it was signed into law last March, over one million private sector jobs have been added to the economy, with 207,000 of those jobs coming from the health care sector. Some speak of the repeal as if eliminating health care reform would have no meaningful fiscal consequences. This, too, is not honest. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated full repeal would increase the deficit by $230 billion over 10 years and another $1.2 trillion in the following decade. Some argue that repeal will, in fact, reduce the deficit. If this is true, why have we yet to see a positive score that affirms such a point? Repeal does nothing, absolutely nothing, other than leaving families with real health insurance, with real health issues, no place to go for help. What do I tell the parents of the 9,000 children in my district with pre-existing conditions who will be unable to access coverage because of the ban on discriminating against children with pre-existing conditions is repealed? 
When insurance companies can, can, can claim cancer or pregnancy as a pre-existing condition, what will survivors and mothers do for health coverage? What will the 126,000 so affected individuals on Eastern Long Island do? What will the 2,400 young adults who have been able to stay on or rejoin their parents' health insurance on Eastern Long Island do if repeal is successful? What do the 112,000 Medicare beneficiaries who can now receive free cancer screenings and other preventive care do? What about the 8,500 Part D prescription drug plan recipients who can no longer count on the donut hole being closed and will once again face higher drug costs if repeal is successful? Mr. Speaker, simply replacing the positive impact the Affordable Care Act has had on American families with inaccurate arguments does not solve expired. our problem. I urge Gentleman my colleagues Minnesota to vote recognized. no on this Mr. Speaker, at uh, this time, I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to another new member of the committee, a physician, the gentleman from Nevada, Dr. Heck. The gentleman from Nevada is recognized for one minute. Two Was it two minutes? The gentleman is recognized you, for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, increasing access to high-quality health care while reducing costs. That was the goal of the recently enacted health care law. But no matter how well-intentioned, very few now stand by that law in its entirety. The new health care law will cost money that taxpayers don't have and will cost jobs we can't afford to lose. Now is the time to re-examine this misguided law before young families are forced to buy something they can't afford or face fines from their government, before seniors are forced to find a new doctor or lose the kind of insurance plan they enjoy now, before small businesses shed jobs or are forced to close its doors due to budget-busting regulations. More access, lower cost. It's safe to say that every American supports that idea. As an emergency medicine doctor, I know that I do. And working on the front lines of health care, I've seen what works and what doesn't. Forcing people to buy insurance or fining them eliminating seniors' access to Medicare Advantage, burdening small businesses with onerous taxes don't work. What the American people want are solutions that don't cost more taxpayer money and don't prevent small businesses from hiring new employees, making sure people don't lose their coverage once they get sick, letting dependent children stay on their parents' insurance until they turn 26 making sure anyone who wants to buy insurance can purchase a policy regardless of pre-existing conditions and allowing consumers choice while creating incentives to purchase insurance that fits their needs works. Some of these solutions are there, but there is more wrong with this bill than there is right. So let's repeal this law that doesn't work. Let's repair those pieces that could work. Let's replace it with patient-centered solutions that will work, and let's give the American people the health care they deserve. I yield back. Back, gentleman from California. I yield uh, uh, two minutes to the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Hirono, a member of the committee. Gentlelady from Hawaii is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to place my full statement into the record. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, Democrats' top priority is creating jobs. We want to work with Republicans to achieve this goal, but instead of focusing on jobs and growing the economy, the new leadership has decided to start by debating H.R. 2, which will repeal patients' rights, put insurance companies back in charge, and add to the deficit. Yesterday, the Democratic Steering and Policy Committee held the only hearing the new Congress will have on this bill. We heard from families from Maine to Florida, from Rhode Island to Missouri, real people, real stories. Freedom was a common thread in their stories. Because of health care reform, these families are free from worrying about being denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition, free from worrying about escalating medical debt because of lifetime caps on their insurance plans. These families now have a sense of security and peace of mind. For over 37 years, thanks to Hawaii's landmark prepaid health care act, our families have largely been protected from some of the most unfair insurance company practices. But health care reform is still helping thousands of families and small businesses across my state. A mother in Kailua, Hawaii contacted me to tell me that she can now add her 21-year-old son and 24-year-old daughter to her work-sponsored insurance plan. This mom used to pay $900 a month for just her daughter's health insurance and prescription drugs. Now she pays $300 a month to cover both of her children under her company's plan.
This family used to spend $10,800 a year for health care for one child. Now they spend $3,600 a year for health care for the entire family. I recently heard from a senior in Waimea on Hawaii Island who referred to her $250 Medicare donut hole rebate check as a blessing in these tough economic times. Let's be clear, the Patients' Right to Repeal Act will hurt, not help, middle class families and small businesses in Hawaii and across our nation. I urge my colleagues to join me in voting General, against General HR2. General Lee's Mahalo nui loa. General from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now I'm pleased to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise in support of repealing and replacing the recently enacted health care law that nationalizes nearly one-sixth of our country's gross domestic product. This past November, the American people sent a resounding message to Congress and to this administration that they do not want to pay higher taxes for a one-size-fits-all health care system that replaces doctors with bureaucrats. Instead, the American people want complete control of their health care dollars and health care decisions, and they want to be able to take their policies with them from job to job without being penalized by the federal government. Americans need privatized health care that forces competition in order to achieve affordability, choice, and innovation. As a small business owner, I understand that adding $104 billion in taxes and compliance costs to our unstable job market creates a massive burden on our taxpayers and is not the best way to encourage economic growth. Imposing new regulations on small businesses. The gentleman's time expired. Thank you. Additional 15 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for an additional 15 seconds. Speaker, we can bring down costs and increase affordability by allowing the free market to create robust competition. One common sense reform is to allow for the interstate sale of health insurance policies across state lines. Allow consumers choice, allow the market to determine the affordability and the availability of policies. Mr. Speaker, I yield back my time. The gentleman Thank yields you. back. The gentleman from California. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, in 1986, over 66 percent of America's employers provided retiree health insurance. In 2009, that number had collapsed to 29 percent. What the health care bill did was use a tried and true method of setting up a reinsurance program that we use for flood insurance, terrorism insurance, to insure the nuclear energy industry. And this fund, which will cost share and cost uh, uh, spread, the, the uh, high claims of older 55 plus Americans um, is a program that employers have stampeded into. Over 4,700 employers have entered this program, over half the Fortune 500, many whose corporate logos are right here, something that Coke and Pepsi and ATT and, and Comcast can come together on. They are voting with their feet because this is a program that works. Mr. Speaker, public employers are also taking advantage. This map shows yellow states who have not entered the program. If you notice, no yellow states have not entered the program. All 50 states with Republican governors, Democratic governors uh, have entered this, this program. States who are suing the federal government to overturn the health care bill, uh, they know a program that's going to work to make sure that their health care costs are going to be controlled and spread. This means that police officers, teachers, people working in corporations who are 55 and up can retire with confidence, opening up opportunities for young Americans, uh, which the, uh, clearly the prior system uh, was not going to allow. Mr. Speaker, this bill will blow up this program, which employers have, are voting with their feet, says will work. That is not creating jobs. This program creates jobs. It lowers costs for employers and provides an avenue for young people to have a future in this country. We should vote no on this legislation. Let's grow America's economy. Let's preserve the early retiree reinsurance program. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield one minute to uh, another position, the gentleman from Louisiana, Dr. Fleming. The gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Speaker, repealing Obamacare is an imperative for four reasons. First, while it increases the numbers under coverage, it will ultimately sharply reduce access to care. Like Canada and Britain, 
Socialized medicine will mean carrying an insurance card that will entitle you only to less choice, longer waits, and rationing. Second, while the health care system is now hard to navigate, under Obamacare it will be a nightmare. With over 150 new mandates and agencies controlled by unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats and IRS agents, to whom will we turn when the system fails us? Third is yet another entitlement program financed through a Disney fantasy of accounting. It will add to the current entitlement fiasco in Washington, exploding the budget for many generations to come. And finally, with higher taxes and more constrictions on businesses, employed Americans will continue to decline or become an endangered species altogether. Let's repeal the worst legislation in a generation, Obamacare. Time. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman from California. I just say to the, the gentleman from Minnesota, I think I'm starting to understand the physician shortage in the country. Most of them are in the Congress, apparently. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I yield one minute to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I am committed to working with my colleagues to create jobs. But here we are debating repeal of health care reform instead of focusing on job creation. In fact, health care reform was a good start. Since enactment in March of 2010, private sector job growth has grown by some 1.1 million jobs. Among those, over 200,000 jobs were created in the health care sector alone. That is why my top priority remains job creation and growing our economy, not obsessing on repealing a bill that is working. If my friends on the other side of the aisle are successful, then seniors, young people, and small businesses in the capital region of New York would be hurt. Take my constituent Tim from Albany, New York, for example. Tim is forced to dig into his pocket to pay for prescription drugs, even though he is a retired pharmacist on Medicare. However, health care reform provides Tim extra assistance in paying for his prescriptions and ensures that the so-called donut hole payment will be no more in the very near future. Time has expired. Gentleman from uh, Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am really pleased, following the comments of the gentleman from California, to yield one minute to another physician, a new member of the committee, the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 2. As a practicing physician for nearly two decades in Tennessee, I stand before you as an expert witness to failures of a government-run health care model. Obamacare takes the problems I've seen in my home state and expands them to a national level. This bill raises taxes, increases spending, and will add $701 billion to the federal deficit. Most importantly, Obamacare will ultimately end up restricting patients' access to quality health care by placing Washington bureaucrats between patients and their doctors. Moving forward, we do offer solutions. We must work towards reducing waste, fraud, and abuse in Medicare, instituting meaningful tort reform, thus reducing the practice of defensive medicine. We can't accomplish these goals without the creation of a giant new federal bureaucracy. By voting to repeal this unnecessary health care bill, we will effectively put a stop to the creation of a massive entitlement program that we did not want, we do not need, and we gentleman, cannot afford. Gentleman's time to I yield back. Gentleman from California. I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Bass. Gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to H.R. 2. In survey after survey, the number one issue facing our country is jobs. Last year, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle said the number one issue we should be working on is jobs. Well, the Health Care Reform Act is a jobs bill. In the 70s and 80s, I worked in several hospitals in the Los Angeles area. During those years, there was such a severe shortage of health care providers that hospitals recruited nurses from Canada and the Philippines. Right now, there is an estimated shortage of 400,000 nurses nationally. Right now, there is an estimated shortage of 50,000 doctors. Right now, there are waiting lists of several years to get a slot in nursing schools and other allied health professions. So if there is a shortage of medical personnel right now, 
and health care reform expands coverage to 30 million people, then can someone explain to me how health care reform is not a jobs bill? Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Pence. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding and would ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. I rise in strong support of H.R. 2, repealing the government takeover of health care passed by the 111th Congress. Now, I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and uh, many of their supporters in the mainstream press don't like us to use that term, but let me defend it for a moment. When you order every American to buy health insurance, whether they want it or need it or not, that's a government takeover of health care. When you order almost every business to provide government-approved health insurance or pay higher taxes uh, and send their employees to government-run health exchange programs, that's a government takeover of health care. Uh, when you pass legislation that makes it all run with hundreds of billions of dollars in higher taxes, mandates, bureaucracies, and even public funding of abortion against the wills of the overwhelming majority of the American people, that's a government takeover of health care, and the American people know it. Now, last year, House Republicans pledged that if the American people gave us a second chance to lead this Congress, we would repeal and replace their health care reform with health care reform that focuses on lowering the cost of health insurance without growing the size of government. And we're keeping that promise today. Now some in the, the cynical political class are saying this is a gimmick. It's an empty gesture. Well, we have another term for it on our side of the aisle. It's a promise kept. And House Republicans are here to stand with the American people and say with one voice, we can do better. We can do better than their government takeover of health care. We can pass legislation that will be market-based, patient-centered, but it all begins with today. So I urge my colleagues to join us in repealing this government takeover of health care before it ever takes effect, and then work with us as we build health care reform that is worthy of the American people. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California. I yield 30 seconds to the gentleman from uh, New Jersey. Speaker, I wanted to explore one of the aspects of this repeal promise that's being kept. Uh, thus far, there are hundreds of thousands of seniors who've gotten $250 rebate checks to help them pay for prescription drugs. What does, I would ask anyone on the other side, what does the legislation say about whether or not the seniors will have to repay those checks uh, to the government? I would yield to anyone who could answer. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California. To the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne. Was that one and a half minutes? One and a half minutes, yes. The gentleman's recognized for one and a half minutes. Very Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong opposition to the Patients' Rights Repeal Act. Proponents of this bill contend that the current health law will destroy jobs, but CBO estimates that $230 billion support the fact that it is the repeal being debated today, not the health care law that would harm jobs and drain funds from potential job building appropriations. Essentially, that is being repealed and uh, the protections afforded to taxpayers through the recently enacted health care legislation, the relief given to the American taxpayers who were for so long paying the bills for uncompensated health care, which we never hear mentioned over there, and the progress our country made last year to come out of the dark ages as one of the only three developed countries in the world that do not provide universal health care. 4,800 seniors in my district and over 1 million seniors in the country were relieved last year by the donut hole rebate, but repeal would reintroduce, reintroduce that stress nearly 44 percent of elderly constituents in New Jersey and 134 million Americans nationwide have pre-existing conditions. Repeal would reintroduce the hopelessness that Americans felt in the past as health coverage denied and stole their ability to access to quality health care. Repeal would remove nearly 1.2 million young adults from their parents' health care, including my grandson, who's 23 and is on his mother's plan, and remove their ability to take preventive measures now to avoid becoming a burden to the health care system. Expired. I urge the feet of this bill. General from Minnesota. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I yield to the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, I take about 10 seconds to respond to my 
friend, the gentleman from New Jersey, about the $250 is not contemplated in the legislation, nor is it our understanding the scoring that there's any intention of, of that $250 being clawed yeah, back. Will from the gentleman yield? I will yield now to the uh, two minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, we request unanimous consent to revise and extend. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as a health care professional for almost 30 years, I actually sat down and read all 2,000 pages of the health care bill. And as I read through the measure, I became increasingly alarmed at the level of control over an individual's health that would be vested in the federal government. I've spent my life working with those facing life-altering disabilities and diseases. And I've been quick to point out that while we have the best health system in the world, there must be improvements. That is why I'm supporting the repeal of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and I believe there are plenty of reasons for my colleagues to join me. The law mandates purchase of a government-defined insurance plan, a mandate that the President opposed on several occasions when running for office. As a result of failing to live up to this promise, the Justice Department is now attempting to defend the mandate on the grounds that it is a tax. According to the nonpartisan Medicare actuary, because of the law, national spending will increase by more than $310 billion over the first 10 years. The law will not lower health care costs despite numerous claims that we've heard. According to the Congressional Budget Office analysis, health insurance premiums could rise by an average of $2,100 per family. This increase comes despite promises of lower premiums. Mr. Speaker, if this law remains in place, up to 35 million people could lose health care access. According to the former CBO direct, budget director, the health care law, quote, provides strong incentives for employers with the agreement of their employees to drop employer-sponsored health insurance for as many as 35 million Americans. The National, National Taxpayer Advocate issued a report that suggests 40 million businesses will be impacted by the new IRS 1099 filing requirements. This will require vendors and small businesses to do paperwork on any transaction over $600. In addition, the taxpayer advocate does not believe that this will result in improved tax compliance. This provision is so unrealistic that even the President's small business administrators called for its repeal. Mr. Speaker, we must repeal and replace this law and continue together as the, the entire Congress, not just two parties, and move forward with the common sense ideas that will include better access, affordability, quality, and promote patient choice. I encourage inspired. my colleagues to join me and vote for repeal. The gentleman from California. I yield one minute to the gentleman, Mr. Cohn. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, sir. I'm going to cite two Republicans who give good reasons to pass, to oppose this legislation and keep health care reform. One of the new Republicans, when he didn't think he was going to get his insurance immediately, said, what am I not supposed to have health care? It's a practicality. I'm not going to become a burden for the state because I don't have health care and God forbid I get into an accident and I can't afford the operation. That can happen to anyone. He succinctly summed up the reason why everyone should have the same opportunities as members of Congress have to have health care. But more importantly, in a more intentional way, one of the most revered doctors in the world, former Republican Majority Leader, Senator Bill Frist, said yesterday, that he urged the Republicans to drop the charade and build on the legislation. He said if he would have been here, he'd have voted for the bill, and it was important to consider the bill the law of the land and move from there. It is the platform, the fundamental platform, upon which all future efforts to make the system better for the patient and the family will be based, and that is a fact. It has strong General elements. Time's expired. I support Dr. Frist. General Thank Minnesota. you. Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased now to yield one minute to a member of the committee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the gentleman yielding. I rise today in support of House Bill 2. This simple two-page bill seeks to repeal the new unconstitutional health care law that will create a massive new entitlement program, cost taxpayers more than $2 trillion per decade, increase taxes, and impose job-destroying mandates on businesses, cut Medicare by hundreds of billions of dollars, and further increase health care premiums for individuals by more than 10 percent. The goal is not only to repeal the new health care law, but also to replace it with real reforms debated openly through the ordinary legislative process that are truly about reducing health care costs. Reforms such as allowing small businesses and individuals to join together in national group plans to cut premium costs, allowing individuals to purchase health insurance across state lines thereby increasing competition for their businesses and enacting medical malpractice liability reform legislation. I will continue to push for common sense reforms 
that are focused on truly reducing health care costs for all Americans. I urge my colleagues to support H.R. 2. Gentleman's Thank time you, gentlemen, expired. First time. Yield gentleman back. California. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, with unemployment in Michigan at over 12 percent, I'm not going to support a bill that raises taxes on small businesses. Let us be clear. Voting for the Patient Rights Repeal Act will eliminate the small business health care tax credit. Small businesses have faced outrageous increases in their health care costs over the past decade. This tax credit helps reduce that burden and is already making a real difference. The LA Times reported that small businesses are signing up for health care coverage for their employees despite the bad economy since the tax credit took effect. Among firms with three to nine employees, there has been a 46 percent increase in the number offering health benefits. But this bill would put a stop to that. The Detroit News reported that last week that more than 126,000 small businesses in Michigan would lose the tax credit under this bill. The last thing that small businesses in Michigan and across the country need right now is higher taxes. But that's exactly what this bill would deliver. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no and join me in standing up for our small businesses. Back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield one minute to a new member of the committee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Barletta. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. I thank the chairman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of repealing the health care law. I believe everyone should have access to affordable, quality health care. However, the law passed last year does the contrary. It makes health care less affordable. It diminishes the quality of care. It forces seniors out of their Medicare drug coverage, and it prevents small businesses from getting Americans back to work. In my district, we have the highest number of seniors in Pennsylvania and the $206 billion in cuts in Medicare Advantage will cause 7.5 million seniors to lose their retiree drug co coverage by 2016. Small businesses face a $2,000 fine per employee if their plans do not meet a bureaucrat-approved standard. At a time when the unemployment level in my district is over 9 percent, Congress must not discourage job creation by placing mandates and levying penalties on those who will get us back on track towards a more prosperous nation. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on H.R. 2, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. I yield the one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wu. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized for one and one and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While America desperately wants more and better jobs, Washington Republicans want to waste time today debating a health care repeal charade. But let's look at what health care reform repeal would actually do. In my congressional district alone, repealing this law would allow insurance companies to deny coverage for up to 360,000 individuals with pre-existing conditions, including 45, 000, up to 45,000 children. Let's mend this act. Don't end it. A repeal would eliminate health care tax credits for up to 19,000 small businesses and 164,000 families. Mend it. Don't end it. A repeal would eliminate new health care coverage options for 3,100 uninsured young adults. It is time to mend it and not to end it. In 50 years, Mr. Speaker, health care reform will stand beside Social Security, the GI Bill, and Medicare as a pillar of American health care and humane values. The people of that time will not understand why it was hard to pass in the first place or why we are spending time today rehashing old business. It's time to fix health care reform's remaining deficits and to mend it and not to end it. I yield back the balance of my time. If I may inquire, State your inquiry. Uh, how much time is available on, on both sides? The gentleman from California has eight and one half minutes. The gentleman from Minnesota has 15 minutes. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'm pleased to yield one minute to another new member of the committee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. The gentleman is recognized. I thank the gentleman for yielding time. Mr. Speaker, last week, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said that the, the economy cannot begin to recover until small businesses prosper. Well, the overreaching and burdensome requirements of Obamacare will hurt small businesses, and their benefits are not even certain. 
Small companies which account for over half the private sector economy are more likely to struggle than survive under this, this law. If I had followed the plan prescribed by my, for my dealership under the, after the takeover, the government takeover of General Motors, I would have lost the business that my father started 57 years ago. We need to address the years of hard work and the spirit of entrepreneurship that will be destroyed under this law. Small employers have limited autonomy under Obamacare. The federal government is dictating what benefits they must offer and then punishing them for expanding their operations or paying their people more. The choices for small business under Obamacare are provide government-mandated health care and face ruinous cost, or drop the coverage and pay, fine, and pay fines just to keep those folks employed. If we burden small businesses' requirements set forth in this law, we hamper the recovery of the U.S. economy and damage the spirit of free enterprise that has made America great for over two centuries. America, a model of care should be replaced and, and with a smaller, Gentleman more time sense expired. program. Gentleman thank you, sir. Gentleman from Minnesota. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I understand an effort to balance the time here. Yes. Uh, we have an embarrassment of riches and numbers of, of speakers. Um, it's what happens in November. So uh, at this time, I'm pleased to yield uh, one minute to a member of the committee, the gentlelady from Illinois, Mrs. Biggert. The gentlelady from Illinois is recognized for one minute. I thank, the, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and Mr. Speaker, I rise today to voice my support for H.R. 2, repealing last year's misguided health care law. Whether it's drop coverage, higher costs, and lost jobs, the unintended consequences of the administration's plan have piled up. I don't think it's, the law is salvageable. We must craft a bipartisan replacement that actually lowers costs and ex expands access to care without raising taxes and slashing Medicare. Americans want consensus-minded reforms to expand coverage for pre-existing conditions and prevent insurers from imposing unfair caps and canceling policies. They want reforms that provide more choice over how to spend their health care dollars, like purchasing health insurance across state loans. And they want common sense legislation to curb junk lawsuits and to stop costly practices of defensive medicine. I urge my colleagues to join me in fulfilling the wishes of voters and repealing uh, Obamacare. Then we can work together on reforms and, that deliver the high quality, low cost care the American people deserve. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Speaker, uh, at this time I'm pleased to yield uh, one minute to the Chairman of the Financial Services Committee, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Bacchus. The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first rule of a physician is do no harm. The government takeover of health care does a lot of harm and the damage will get worse. Just on pure economics, it's a bitter pill. Small businesses are facing tax increases, higher cost, they're dropping coverage, they're holding off on new hires. The federal government is taking on a new open-ended entitlement it can't afford. And that at a time of historically high deficits, annual deficits, and a national debt. Washington yet again is building a new bureaucracy to tell people what to do. The federal government has no business making private medical decisions that ought to be between you and the doctor. It violates the principles on which this country was established, American exceptionalism. America is not Europe. Our system is based on the individual, on choice, on freedom, on individual initiative and competition. The mandate asking individuals to buy health insurance is an intrusion on our personal liberty and a violation of our constitutional privilege. And finally, an additional second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'll reserve. I'm going to the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the health care law in opposition to its repeal. The health care reform, which was signed into law last year, is clearly not perfect and could be improved. However, the law, as enacted, will have significant benefits to millions of American citizens, to businesses, to local governments, and to the country as a whole. The benefits to individuals in need of health care with pre-existing conditions, to seniors, to young adults under 26 years of age, and many other groups are well known and will be missed if the law is repealed. 
but most significantly, the law will drive down the cost of health care by encouraging and incentivizing quality care and good outcomes in health care treatments instead of encouraging potentially unnecessary procedures. It rewards quality rather than quality of health care. This will ultimately reduce the cost, both public and private, of health care in this country. Because of these reasons, I strongly oppose repeal of health care reform. And I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to yield one minute now to the gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the claim that this new health care law will somehow, will somehow cut our budget deficits is proof that logic does not always prevail here in Washington, D.C. This is a $2 trillion additional entitlement. And just like past entitlement programs, this one will be far more costly than, than projected. As a result, our budget deficit is going to increase unless we repeal this. It's going to, it's going to increase our dependence on China and Japan to finance our debt. The credit rating agencies say we are on the verge of losing our AAA credit rating and the this debt contagion, you all see it, it's continuing to spread across Europe. Let us take this important step, repeal this $2 trillion fiscal train wreck and begin work on market-based solutions that will actually lower health care costs. This will give us some hope in the future of bringing that budget into balance and not Inspired. hitting that fiscal train wreck. Thank you. Gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, now I am pleased to yield to a new member of this body,